Hello and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Melissa Bell, CNN's correspondent here in Paris, uh, from where CNN covers the whole of Europe. And of course, precisely the kinds of questions we're going to be addressing today. The name of this session is New Leadership uh, for New Models. And the idea is to speak to people at the helm of their companies and at the forefront of these sorts of changes about how and why and whether they've succeeded in achieving that uh, search, that reach for sustainability within their business models, what the costs have been, what the benefits have been, what the lessons learned have been, what the lessons learned rather have been, and, and how successful or difficult uh, they've found it. We have a great uh, set of panels coming up for you. This is going to be divided into three parts. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Now, our first guest today I'd like to introduce uh, needs very little here in France. Pierre Louet, of course, is extremely well known uh, here in France. Uh, he is, uh, of course, today the CEO of the group Les Echos uh, Le Parisien, which is the uh, media division of LVMH. Before that, uh, he was uh, within uh, the group uh, Orange, of course, in charge notably of Orange Wholesale. And in that capacity, he negotiated what we've come today for granted, which is a fair amount of uh, free roaming for which we're very grateful. He's also, of course, been the president of the French Federation uh, of telecoms and uh, the CEO and then chairman of the AFP. We're really delighted uh, to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much indeed. I wanted to begin by asking you perhaps to present your group, its raison d'être, and to tell us a little bit about what you're up to. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to, um, to tell everyone what the group is, has been up to um, over the recent years. I joined the group three years ago, as you mentioned, I was uh, uh, deputy CEO of Orange before, and Orange uh, will be illustrated, I think, by Stéphane Chat in a couple of minutes. Um, Orange had uh, a long history in, in responsibility. Our group had a shorter one. So we decided, actually, when I joined, because I had some personal commitments to that uh, topic, because of, because of my family, basically, my wife, my, my daughter, uh, who had told me that there was much to do in that area, we decided to put an emphasis on, on the group's commitment to helping uh, raise the attention of the public and also being a tool for mobilization, for informing and mobilizing uh, the audience. So first of all, um, what happened was that the law changed in France. You know, there, is, there, is, there was a new law called La Loi Pacte, the Pacte Law, uh, which changed dramatically uh, the, the, the main purpose of, of a company, if you want, in France. Originally, uh, a company uh, in its legal description was a place where you share profits, which is rather important, you know, of course, and extremely important in many ways, but, but maybe not uh, a way to capture all the contributions that a society, that a company, that a firm can bring to, uh, to the world. So this law introduced the fact that, yes, you have to share profits, but you also have to have a positive impact on the world. So we decided that we would um, put this in our, in our group's strategy, and we adapted, we adopted, I'm sorry, uh, a, um, you know, a purpose, uh, which is Les Echos Le Parisien Group is committed to fostering the emergence of a responsible society by informing, mobilizing, and supporting citizens and businesses every day. We decided to put this uh, in our group's uh, definition in our purpose in order to uh, be part of the solution. Not, it, on, not only describing the problems, but also trying to be part of the solution. Well, I hope on, that covered most of your question. On that point, uh, uh, I think it's, it's a really important uh, and interesting way to present it. We're simply looking at the way business models should function in an entirely different way. Give us an idea of some concrete examples, perhaps, from within your group of steps that have been taken, of changes that have been made that correspond to this attempt, this reach for business models that go beyond the idea simply of making money? Well, uh, first of all, we had to establish um, how our group was uh, organized in, in terms of its uh, um, you know, contribution to the overall pollution of the world, which is one of the problems that we have to face and, and deal with. So we, we had our a carbon uh, uh, signature uh, defined. We, we work with Carbon uh, Cat, which is a, a great uh, company here. Jean-Marc Jancovici, an incredible pioneer, I would say, of, of those uh, questions. And so we found out that there was a lot of things that we could do on our own, and also many things that are linked to our uh, partners. Um, we don't own a print factory, for instance, so we have to 
to work with other people in order to have a paper which is um, you know, recycled or also produced by responsible forests. So we, we put this in place. Uh, we have printers, they use um, uh, inks, you know, those inks can also be a major factor of pollution. So we ask them to uh, work more and more with um, green inks, if you want. Uh, the problem being that those green inks are not completely perfect yet, and sometimes they, they don't stay on the paper well, so we ask them to invest and do more efforts. So, so we had to cover all of those aspects. Also, our digital pollution, everybody knows today that um, you know, uh, we send a lot of emails. Uh, we ask our readers uh, if they want to read more of what we produce. We have a lot of newsletters. So all of those are sent abroad across the floor, maybe in, in too vast a number. And also they are stocked and kept in data uh, where data houses, which, which are a bit uh, data centers, uh, also a bit contributing to the overall pollution. So we have to work on all of those aspects. Uh, this typically was, was our first way to, to try to be in harmony with our purpose. Um, and then also uh, we decided that we wanted to be, uh, also because we, mem you know, we are members of a, a large uh, group, LVMH, which has been at the forefront of those questions uh, ever, th ever since uh, 2001, I think, when they adopted uh, initially a charter um, and a group that shows every day how much they want to, to contribute also to non-production and, and being more responsible, uh, we decided that we were going to have a deeper, stronger, more regular coverage of those issues. And this has been very blatant in our, in our productions. Now, on that question, uh, the kinds of changes that you're talking about are, are pretty substantial. Tell us a little bit about the putting in place of the strategy. How difficult was it uh, to take your employees with you to uh, get to that level of uh, a, a profound sense that the need change needs to come from everyone, that it needs to be systemic, that you need to take essentially your company with you. And there are changes when you think about the cult cultures of a company that are difficult to bring about. Uh, tell us a little bit about what some of the challenges were. Tell us a little bit about how you did it. Well, you know, maybe, um First of all, we have to remember that someone said that uh, you know, management is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So you have to run for you know, 42 kilometers and a bit more even. So it, it takes some time. But actually, um, uh, it wasn't that difficult. You know? Actually, I think what was more difficult was for some of our employees to, to, to say that uh, at, at home they work you know, because they are personally motivated. They work on uh, you know, recycling, um, not mixing uh, stuff that, that could be recycled with stuff that can't be recycled. And when they came into the office, there was no way for them to, uh, to play that, that game, you know, and, and to be part of the, of the solution. The company did not offer them a way to, you know, continue their commitment um, uh, during the, the work hours at the office. So we, did, we found out actually that a lot of people were telling us, well, at last, you know, finally you, you tell us that we're going to be also playing that role and, and being in harmony with our commitments when we come into the office. So it wasn't really difficult. Um, we asked a lot of the newsrooms to, to, um, to put more emphasis uh, and again, uh, we found out that the more we produced, the more it was read. Um, I have one example on, on top of my mind. You know, of course, Le, Le Parisien produced a green version of Le Parisien. Les Echo did too at one point. But there is a, a, a newspaper we have weekly, which is called Investir. The uh, word is very similar to the English word. It means uh, it's dedicated to an audience that wants to invest uh, savings and invest uh, money uh, on, this, on the stock market and in different uh, uh, instruments. And uh, they produced a green investing. They produced also a rank listing of the companies, not based like you know, the Nasdaq or the CAC 40 on um, um, just the financial performances, but based on what uh, those companies produce in terms of many different uh, uh, paradigms, which are contribution to the planet, non-pollution, uh, wealth, and, and also um, you know the good environment for for the for the employees to work in, and this this edition they produced was the best uh, selling edition they ever did, and of course it became uh, something that they do every month, and each month it's a green investir. Uh, I have it actually here uh, with me. It, it's it's something that's in green, which is a different color, 
and it is followed, hugely followed by all the people who want to invest, but on, not only to invest um, you know, directly in, in um, companies that contribute to, to depollution or to recyclable energies, but they also do not want to invest in companies that do not show their commitment. So I think that, that was a major, you know, a major sign. And uh, if we had had any difficulties, which is not the case, to convince the, the newsrooms, they were completely convinced by the reaction of the audiences. It's really interesting, both, both first of all, that it has come from the bottom up. Uh, also, yeah. that uh, what we're talking about are obvious costs, but perhaps unexpected opportunities as well. Uh, and that perhaps that is the best way of looking at it. In terms of your, the content, in terms of covering the kinds of stories uh, that, that surround this, do you find that there's a thirst in your readership for precisely that? Is that something you've been doing more and more of by trying to cover a story that's only really become a story these last 10 years? Yeah, it's become, it's become a new field of coverage, uh, basically. Uh, I think it started with um, first uh, articles written about reports, you know, Club de Rome a long time ago, of course, but many other reports. There are also Nobel Prizes, and there are many of those uh, um, personalities and huge personalities that have contributed to our thinking in terms of uh, pollution, uh, growth, um, you know, and its uh, capacity to to be led uh, with respect to to the planet's uh, health. So um, the stories originally were of that kind, and then uh, I think the the topic invaded all the parts of the newspapers. If you look at Les Echos, we have two different uh, um, um, parts. You know, one is to the macroeconomic side, and the other is the microeconomic. And and all over the place, you find articles about uh, companies that are more responsible. Uh, companies that were in the microeconomic side funded because they have something to to do with the depollution. Uh, companies that have created indexes, you know, it's all over the place, and, and I think that's uh, that's very um, it's a very good sign, uh, basically, because I am you know without. Uh, being an expert at all, I've, I've tried to read a lot of things uh, from different sides, actually, of, of the opinions related to the planet and to the responsibility. But I think everybody knows that we don't have much time uh, left in front of us before we change. You know, we change a lot of things. I think it's also uh, the topic of uh, this fantastic Change Now event, you know, which we, we are trying also to back it with all of our of our efforts, change now, you know, it's not change in a thousand years, we need to change pretty many things now. That realization, and as you've alluded to uh, so far, the very profound societal changes that are going on, uh, in, in a sense, mean that it isn't about companies, you know, producing CSR reports and, and living up to tell this or that regulation. It's actually a societal change. It isn't so much that companies need uh, to invest and accept costs in order to reluctantly follow a trend. It is rather that there is a sort of realization everywhere that there are opportunities that will be missed out if these companies don't change their way entirely of looking at these questions. Opportunities will be missed out. Um, a lot of value will be destroyed. Too. Uh, you know, I am I'm a liberal. I, I work uh, for a company. Um, uh, we, we try to cover all aspects of the business around us and, and all aspects of people's life. Also, in the Paisa is more general than, than Les Echos, obviously. Um, but I am a keen believer in the fact that uh, there is a possible reconciliation between the interests of the companies and uh, the interests of the planet. You know, this is what we're trying to find, this is what we're trying to define also. But there is a way, uh, there is a way. It's very obvious in many ways, you know, if you destroy too much, you will not be able to produce and you will also destroy your consumers at one point. So without going to that extreme uh, and simplistic uh, reasoning, uh, there are ways to be found. And there is a lot of value to be created by investing in uh, non-polluting um, companies, their systems or techniques, uh, technologies. Uh, there is a lot of value to be created in covering those issues. Uh, again, as I mentioned previously, we find out that we don't ever produce enough, you know, our readers want more and more. Uh, and our advertisers, also the ones that, you know, buy uh, space uh, on our websites, also in our newspapers, uh, they want to be associated to, to those contents. They want to, uh, the readers to know that uh, they are keenly interested in the solutions and they want to be part of the solution, not only part of the problem, obviously. 
I think this has become um, a very uh, general um, way of, of uh, thinking, and, and at last, you know, uh, uh, the ones that were on, on the road uh, 10 years ago were pretty solitaries, you know. Uh, now it's become more general. We have to be aware, obviously, of whatever way it comes to greenwashing. Mm. We have to be aware of one thing. A lot of our readers, I think most of our readers, and also many more in the future, they will have a very good decoder in knowing who's doing greenwashing and who's sincere. And this is good, you know. We need to be sincere. It's not just repainting things in a very artificial and superficial way. We need to deeply transform the way we produce and the way we interact with our planet. Part of that, of course, is a generational shift uh, with a much more aware and conscious uh, younger generation arriving. Uh, out of schools and universities and heading into real life. Um, uh, I, I wonder what your hopes are that this is something that's going to seem so obvious as to no longer be a topic of conversation fairly quickly. Well, the, the hopes are very strong, and uh, but, but also the present, the reality today shows us that it's going in that direction. Um, I, I guess almost no young woman, young man, coming out of a of college or looking for a job uh, uh, would not look into what the company he wants to be hired by is doing in terms of responsibility, um, common sense, common interest. You know, everybody looks at, uh, at that. Everybody looks at the rank listing of the company, what they produce. Does it make sense? Is it meaningful? Is it harmful? I think that's a major change. You know, um, when I started working, to take that example, it was not something that you would look at. You know, right. or maybe some of my um, uh, fellow colleagues at that time would do that, but sincerely, I, I didn't. You know, you, you were looking for a job, you, you wanted to start you know, entering into a career. But I think now um, the younger generation really wants to reconciliate um, their commitments their preoccupations also, and the kind of job they're going to do. So I think this is, this is today. It's not only looking forward in the next five or ten years, it's already today, and that is, uh, that is a very strong sign. Also, we need not to um, uh, forget, and, and again, Change Now shows a lot of those examples, that this is a discussion between people from the Western world, I'm sorry to say, but in a lot of emerging countries, um, uh, many efforts are already led, and many more efforts should be done, you know, in order to stop uh, productions which are undergoing now, um, because because we're we're an interconnected world, and we know it also oh, we... uh, from obvious uh, medical reasons from the recent year. Uh, it is completely interconnected. We need to work together. We need to link those different parts of the world together. It's a unified world. It's global, also in terms of environment. Uh, of, of course, your point goes to the very heart of the difficulties the European Union is currently facing on its very ambitious program. More generally, though, and finally, we've only got a few minutes left, I wanted to ask you how important you thought the relationship between the private sector and the governments are on this. The United States is a perfect example. For four years, climate change was openly denied by the White House. The only hope for any effect on sustainability, climate change came from cities, companies, uh, uh, big, um, big companies, and, and people who had power that was not run from Washington. How important do you think it is, and how important is the leadership of private companies, for instance, when sometimes governments are not acting fast enough, or in the case of the United States, for four years at all? Well, yeah, it's a very, it's a very good point, Melissa. You know, I think um, company leaders have to step up when sometimes um, someone was elected who simply denies um, things and, and doesn't want to be um, interested by things which are so obvious in the world. And, and it's, it's a good sign. Uh, one of the good aspects of the social networks, which you know, I, I regularly criticize for many other reasons, but uh, uh, is that you can, you can mobilize people with this. Uh, and it's also what we are you know, wanting to do and doing with our, with our newspapers online, our radio or TV stations. Uh, we want to give people more platforms to express themselves and also to say, yes, uh, you guys are going in a good direction because what you told us here is interesting and we want more of that again. It, it, it's, a, it's a reciprocal relationship. You, know, you need to engage your readers or your listeners and you need to, to take into consideration what they're telling you. Um, this is uh, not always done by the politicians, but it is sometimes done by the politicians. In France, we have a president who has been uh, quite committed in many ways to that. Maybe not far enough, difficult to 
to go to the last extent to change all the regulations at the same time. Again, it's something that is going to take some years, um, but the citizens can and can take um, can be empowered, you know, by by, by the networks and and also by their traditional uh, newspapers and online publications. We try to empower them more, uh, especially in that direction, especially with that preoccupation. Pierre Edward, we are th so thankful uh, for your time, for your contribution uh, to today's events, to everything that you've told us about your efforts uh, for for the, uh, your group, uh, Les Echos Le Parisien, and are uh, delighted to be able to have a conversation with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great day. Thank you. That takes us now to our uh, next session. We're going to introduce you to a fairly illustrious panel now, also of uh, CEOs who've been, uh, just as Pierre Louet was describing, grappling with some of these problems now for many years, the idea of uh, how greater sustainability can be reached, uh, how it can be sold, first of all, within a company, how it needs to be sold as part of what a company does and what that means, the challenges, the opportunities, and so on. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be able to introduce those guests to you in just a moment. Thank you so much. Yes, we're maskless for this one. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to introduce uh, my panel very quickly, first of all, and we're going to move on to our to our conversation, which I hope we can make as fluid and as 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 uh, as. Um, comfortable between you all as we can. Uh, I'm delighted now to be joined for the next part of this panel by Eamon Azat, who is the uh, CEO, of course, of Capgemini. We're delighted absolutely to have nice you to with here. us. Thank you. Joined also by Mecca Brunel, who's the CEO of Gessina. We are delighted also that you had time to Thank make it here today. Uh, also to have you all in person. This is a new and fairly rare treat after a year and a half of having, having to, had to speak to each other remotely. Delighted also uh, to meet with uh, Stéphane Richard, the CEO, of course, and chair of Orange. Thank you so much all for being uh, with us. Uh, we're going to um, have a look at how each of you, and perhaps we could just start by going around each of you, uh, what the, uh, to give us an idea of how big it is for organizations like yours, which are big mm -hmm. international organizations. How dis difficult is it to affect this kind of change, to put sustainability at the core of what you do, to transform your companies it, so that it isn't, it isn't the changes are made cosmetically, but the way you do business has changed profoundly? Perhaps two first. Yeah, I mean, first. It's quite interesting. I mean, we are a people business, right? We have very limited assets. We have 270,000 people globally in 50 countries. So a lot of it is around basically using the energy of people and getting them on board. But the first thing you need to have is to be able to do, have proper measurement, right? Because everybody talks about five years objective, 10 years objective in terms of how you're going to do carbon neutrality and net zero. But the first thing you really need to have is have a proper carbon accounting in your firm to really be able to measure and understand where it's coming from to be able to put the actions in place. And then after that is really engaging people, right? And we, and we have a young population. You know, the average age of our population is young. It's very easy to engage people on subjects like that. And it is not. And it's true, yeah, if you say 10 years ago, it was an accounting done in the annual report that you had to do. Today, it is not that. For our generation, it was dealt with in a very completed way. Just as Pierre Louet was describing, do you find that your employees, in fact, come with certain expectations that are entirely oh, in tune is, with what is, we're talking about? It is. They don't make a difference between their personal and their professional life. So it has to be consistent. If you're not reflecting what they're aiming for and what they want, they will not come and work for you. Okay. And I see it with my kids. You know, I have older kids, uh, 24 and 28 years old. You know, they look at that. And, 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 and if the company doesn't reflect who they are or what they think they're aiming for in life, they will not take the job independent because it, because of the company. Because it isn't just the money anymore. Exactly. And I think it's very important. And that is a su substantial generational shift. And I think for all of us, delighting, did a good thing to see. Make up your I'm, I'm curious about what you think on that question of measurements. There is, of course, first of all, because we, were at a, we started from nothing, if you go back 20 years on these questions, how difficult is it to put in place a system, first of all, whether you measure your impact and then you try and fix what you may be doing too much of in order to limit its nefarious qualities? Well, uh, first of all, um, I think that you're right. Measurement is key. And uh, we are a real estate company, so we are one of the most polluting, you know, uh, part of the industry all over the world. We started to do the measurement in starting back to 2008 on carbon. And at that time, we didn't have the tool, but we decided with what it had to start and then to improve it over time by 
considering by improving our uh, our business, our experiences, and the way we are we are doing our business, including everybody who is who are involved in our business, all the stakeholders, whoever they are, including shareholders of our listed companies, bringing in the way the, the shift of the way we are considering that, and we have started since 2008. We have divided by uh, half our carbon impact in our buildings. Now we have also to be completely consistent and aware that uh, this is a global issue. It's not just about France or uh, this or that company. It's global. The, the world is not but what country. So we have the, the same type of issues wherever we are in the world. And since 2017, we have accelerated our measurement. We have accelerated our actions. And we, are, we have reduced by 25% uh, during the last four years. And now we have decided to put in place a decarbonation, the global decarbonation program on our existing buildings, which will include also the impact on our end users, the way they are using our spaces. Uh, we would like to be carbon neutral by 2030, and the program is called Canopy 2030. So we, will, we want to accelerate that because we have no, this is not about differentiation. We have no time, we have no other solution, and everybody, and you were talking about uh, our employees, everybody, the, our, the way of thinking has shifted everywhere. So we have no other plan. I mean, there is no other, there's no B plan existing, so we have to do it this way. Which of course must have made a huge difference to you. I'm thinking that a group uh, of yours size with its history, its ways of doing things, its need to keep up with the latest technology. Of course, it was important that your employees saw this naturally uh, as the way forward. How difficult was it to implement a strategy that put sustainability at the heart of what you did? Well, for me, the main problem is not so much about our people, our employees. We are 150,000 uh, people around the world. And clearly, uh, our contribution to uh, the climate change uh, challenge is, is, uh, is something that uh, gathers everyone uh, within our community. I think everyone is pretty much convinced that, uh, that orange must be in the forefront of, uh, of this combat. Uh, I think it is the same for our uh, customers, by the way, especially in the young generation. But I think that uh, it's, it's going to be uh, critical for us in terms of differentiation in the market also to be ambitious in, uh, in this uh, uh, climate change issue as an operator for our customers. Uh, now there are two, I would say, problems or issues that are more complicated. The first one is financial markets. To me, there is still a huge gap uh, in the financial community, in the way they appreciate efforts, ambitions, and costs, by the That's way. So interesting. There is, there is a difference in the way they evaluate costs they and benefits yes. that yeah. does not reflect you, the way yeah. wider society you, you is seeing You have some people, not yet. some yeah. funds, some uh, maybe uh, specialists that are looking to uh, what is the... Uh, 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 climate change uh, um, uh, aspect of our strategies and, and plans, but they are very minority. Uh, not yet enough. Uh, yeah. Not yet. And, and most uh, of, uh, of people in the financial community, they are looking at your EBDA of the next uh, quarter or your CAPEX or your, uh, and they honestly, they don't care about this. Mm -hmm. So this is my, f my first uh, concern. I think we, we have to educate uh, very strongly uh, this part of, uh, of our ecosystem. Uh, and the second is about technology itself. And, and just to say a word on that, my, uh, my sector, the telecom uh, industry, is, is in a quite pr paradoxical situation because we are in the same time a problem because we, of course, uh, we, we produce CO2, mm -hmm. but we are also a solution and a big solution because we are basically connectivity for instance, 5G or fiber, uh, are major enablers for all the rest of the, the, the industry, industry, but also uh, buildings, buildings uh, mobility, yeah. and so yeah. on, yeah. To, uh, to save energy, yeah. to be much more efficient. Yeah. And so we are, I think, one of the most important contributors to, uh, to uh, fight uh, against the, the, the climate change. But we have also to transform deeply ourselves yeah. 
in order to reduce uh, our uh, footprint. I'd like to put that really interesting point to both of you as well. Uh, we've been talking about how generationally the world is changing. There are things that 20 years ago would have seemed uh, oddities or ahead of their time or eccentric positions even that have become essential to the way young people see the world, the way what they want from their jobs, what they want from their companies, what they mm -hmm. expect mm -hmm. from their leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, that that black spot, which is the blind spot of the financial markets, how significant is it? And what is its impact as you try and affect these changes within your companies to each of you? I think, you know, you definitely judge by the financial market, but you have to do some of the things that you consider is right as well, mm -hmm. right? We, we not only rule by what the financial market want and what the it's investors want. It's hard to want. escape their pressure. I understand. It's part of the pressure, but you still have to do what is right. You have to think about the long-term future of your company. And, you know, if being, if being basically uh, very environmentally friendly is part of attracting talent and we are a talent company, that's going to be very important. Maybe investors will not value it for next quarter, but I understand that this is part of my <coughs> responsibility as well to be able to manage an equilibrium between the different stakeholders, right? And the investors is only one of the stakeholders. I have my clients, I have my employees, I have my partners, and I have society at large, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to manage all that ecosystem. You're not just ruled by the financial markets. And yes, it puts pressure, and yes, you have to make arbitrage, but this is part of the job <laughs> that, 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 that we have to do. Do you find yourself fighting that pressure as well? Uh, absolutely, we are, we are doing that all the time. Actually, the financial market is about, you know, short term, Yes. And the sustainability is a long-term struggle. Yes. And the, the, this is really a, 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 a struggle between, you know, managing both. But I 100% agree. We cannot just follow the financial market. And the reason is that they are behind everybody else. By the way, this is very curious. Most of these young people working in the financial sector, they are young, they are, uh, uh, you know, attracted by the same kind of uh, goals this. that everybody else. And at the same time, they are looking at everything on a very short term IRR. Mm -hmm. Now, having said so, for implementing the ESG, uh, you know, uh, KPIs, especially on the carbon neutral and uh, climate change, we definitely need to invest and to inject capex and to inject innovation and to transform our way of thinking to be game changer. We have no choice. Now, having said so, there are also good news on that side too. We announced this week that we have decided, and this was an idea of my financial team, to transform 100% of our bonds to green bonds, uh, existing bonds to become green bonds linked dynamically to the decarbonation and to ESG KPIs of our existing portfolio. So we brought to the market the fact that we are going to transform these bounds on a dynamic way uh, and they will have much more information than they got so far for the bonds existing. And they ha it has been voted at 92%. So it means that the mindset is changing and the remaining 8% is because some, you know, uh, sovereigns do not vote at all which is not the good thing. But globally speaking, this is transformational too. Uh, Stephen and Richard, I'd like to ask you a little bit about what um, public authorities should be doing more. Uh, we've been talking about com big, big companies uh, and how, how, how they can, by their size, by their weight, um, by sometimes what their business is, uh, help affect these changes that are considerably going to have an impact on sustainability and, and fighting climate change. Uh, some governments are playing catch up. Europe tends to be being fairly pronounced in its leadership on these questions and fairly ambitious. Do you, are you getting enough help from public authorities and how more closely do companies need, what would companies like yours need from public authority? More regulation, less regulation, uh, more ambition, less ambition, more meddling, less meddling, I guess is my question. But the, the political ambition, I think, is, is there. Uh, now, uh, if, if we come to a regulation, uh, let's say sectorial regulation uh, in the telecom uh, sector, there is a strong regulation, a very heavy regulation, but to be honest, not very much influenced by, by environmental uh, aspects. So maybe this regulation should take into account uh, more uh, like sustainable uh, aspects instead of only looking uh, to competition or uh, to technical uh, things like uh, spectrum or things like that. The states themselves are sometimes in a sort of con contradictory uh, position because they are, they are talking more and more about uh, climate change issues. But in the same time, if you look at uh, a company like Orange, 
they ask for us more and more money uh, in taxes, in, in spectrum uh, fees, and, and so on. So, uh, because to, to, you know, to, to be able to reach our targets, uh, for instance, at Orange, we, we have uh, the target of being uh, zero uh, uh, carbon free by 2040. We yep. have to put a lot of capital. And so if our money, our resources, you know, uh, must be dedicated to that uh, target, if we pay in the same time billions of euros in taxes, in spectrum and so on, it, it, it's going to be difficult. So I think for states, uh, there is a gap, let's say, between the political uh, injunction and, uh, and the reality of, uh, of, of, what, of, of what they are doing. And maybe the last aspect is that the state, at least in France, is a big shareholder of a number of companies, mm -hmm. including Orange, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I think that as a reference shareholder in those companies, they might have also a little more ambitious uh, policy. Yeah, yeah if Please. I can build on that, I, I think first you need to have more regional regulation at least. Right? I mean, we need to have something common at the European level in terms of what tries to be achieved, okay. what companies have to achieve. You need to have some level of regulation, but not too much. There has to be incentives. There has to be more incentive in yes. terms of basically investing. I mean, some of this should be tax-free. If you're going to invest to be able to improve the planet, then you should, you should get a break somewhere. Because sure. if, to, to follow the political will, it has to also to sh follow in terms but of what the investment They've been slow to are. see that. They, that well, it's, it's, still, it's still not there. It's not, and the other thing, like, for example, I think there should be a carbon market. There has to be a, a, a carbon market that exists like it exists for other things because that creates the pressure. That creates the pressure in terms of if I don't do it, if everybody wants to buy carbon to be able to, to, to offset, at the end of the day, it will become very expensive for everybody. So people will take alternative decision of investing because if not, they have to buy mm -hmm. carbon offset. And all these things have to come in place bit by bit. So there has to be a common framework of thinking between government and business if we want to achieve that. Gabrielle, that is an extremely hard thing to put together. It's a hard thing to organize. How hopeful are it's, you that, uh, that, we're, that it's heading in the right direction and quickly enough? I, I think that the, the real gap is with, uh, between the, in the, uh, um, the ambition and what, the, what the governments want to achieve and the reality of regulations and the fact that the regulations are so local. Mm -hmm. In our industry, they are not coordinated. I mean, you're talking about carbon. Carbon cannot be stopped by the, uh, 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 by, by the, by the border. Uh, it, it, it goes everywhere. The world is not but country, one, one country. So we need to have much more coordination. And what you said is very important, to have incentives. You cannot just only be punishing people. It doesn't work. You need to give them a capacity to improve themselves. And this is going to be a sort of uh, positive impulsive of doing this. Uh, and, and those incentives are not there. It's all about taxation, regulations, and you are wrong and everything. And, and you should give hope, actually, to the yeah, generations if, to come. If, if, if if this is the only case, over time, people get smart about going around regulation, of around measurements. Yeah, of course. That's right. Right. That's so right. it cannot be punishment only, it has to be incentive to do the right thing. So we do a lot of that because we think it's the right thing. But also, you know, the political will has to be followed by basically what it means on the ground to ensure that beyond the regulation, you can put pressure on people doing the right thing. But it cannot only be by pressure. At the end of the day, there has to be something positive about also doing it that basically enables the, the system to hold over time you know, versus, itself, v v versus. versus reacting in the short term. And of course, the problem is that so much of this debate these last few years has been couched in those cost terms. This has to be done for reasons that we understand. It's going to cost everyone. We all have to get together and cost. One of the points that's been made these last few years while the Trump administration was busy denying climate change altogether is that people like Michael Bloomberg, company leaders, have said, look, city leaders, we're going to take over and represent this because we can actually make these changes happen. And a big part of that is presenting it not just as a cost, but also as an incredible amount of opportunities. Yeah. Have you found, for instance, as you've put this at the heart of, of a group like, like, like Orange, that there have been opportunities that might have been overlooked had this not been looked, seen in that way? Well, yes, definitely. Uh, let's take a few quick examples. First, when you build networks that consume less energy, you save cost, you know, because energy is, is more and more expensive. When we invest in a, a solar plant in Jordan, uh, we are going to supply our energy needs for the networks 100% uh, in Jordan, but we are also creating a business model because we are becoming 
uh, energy producers and, and so we, we are going also to be able to sell over capacity of this solar plant in the, in, in the local market. Uh, we have a, a, a huge activity in the venture uh, fund, a corporate venture fund uh, at Orange, uh, 500 million euros invested in uh, all sorts of startups, of course in, the, in technology, but also now and more and more in, uh, in uh, uh, young uh, uh, companies and innovation linked to uh, climate change. So yes, there are plenty of opportunities and basically I think that uh, uh, it's not only a matter of cost, of course, it's, it's a matter of creating value, creating business, and we'll have more and more business and, and profitable business out of this uh, transition. And, and that's the point. And finally, to each of you, and very quickly, because I think we're already overrunning on time or at risk of doing so any second. Very quickly, your, your hopes. You all represent groups that are uh, incredibly large, mm -hmm. that, that, that go way beyond the borders of the uh, countries uh, in which they were born, uh, that represent a, pow a sort of power that some states would only dream of. Um, you will, by the way you've acted, lead smaller companies to behave in a certain way. Are you hopeful? That this is what's yes, I am hopeful because there's a very strong will by people to make that happen, right? I think that will overcome financial market regulation and everything because there's so much energy in people in society at large to make that happen. I think the consciousness over the last year coming out of the pandemic is so high on the subject. We need to keep the intensity. All the more in. so after the pandemic. Exactly. I think yeah, so. Yeah. But it, it brought good things. We, we don't have time to go into detail. Our, our, our big emission is coming from travel. And we realize that we don't have to necessarily to all, to do all the business travel. We dropped our carbon footprint by 50% per employee over the last 12 months just because people stopped traveling. Of right? So I think there are a lot of positive things. Technology can really help in terms of making that happen. You know, I think technology has a big role to play in, in sustainability, in enabling that. But the, the will is there from the people, and I think that will make things happen at the end of the day. Make everyone your thoughts and hopes. Yeah, just in a few words, I think that... Uh, the last year, uh, the, uh, the, the crises are not creating trends, but they have transformed and accelerated those trends. Those trends pre-existed, and now people are much more collaborators, employees, uh, partners, are much more engaged on what makes sense and what the purpose is about, rather than uh, it has freed, actually, our innovation, our capacity to work together and to emphasize what makes sense. I'm not saying that all the issues are fixed, but I'm saying that a lot has been done, and now we have to, it's going to overcome everything. And I, 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 by the way, we are here to say we need to push and change now make it happen now. Yeah. Uh, to you, Stéphane mm -hmm. Richard, I'm curious for your thoughts. Well, for me, it's, we are talking about something which is both a duty yes. for mankind and for leaders, but also a fantastic opportunity. And, and to me, maybe we don't speak enough of the op opportunity side and maybe too much uh, about the It is a duty, yes. but it is a great opportunity. And, and I am very, very optimistic, very enthusiastic also about the, the prospects that this will open for everyone and especially for our industry because, uh, uh, because it's a fantastic uh, uh, objective, it's a fantastic target for all our stakeholders. Employees, once again, especially the young generation, customers, customers uh, and of course uh, the governments, the societies, public opinion, uh, so, um, to me, it's, uh, it's really, uh, uh, in fact, a very good news for, for industry and for business, generally speaking, to have this uh, now sustainability uh, flag and, and, and prospect uh, ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your thoughts. And, and just if I could, and I, I couldn't agree with you more on the fact that the pandemic has given us so many different solutions. It's been delightful to have you all in person yes. in this room. Such a welcome relief from Zooms. Thank you very much indeed Thank for you. taking the Thank time. You. And making Thank the you effort. for having Thank us. You. That brings us to the end of that uh, session, which slightly uh, uh, overran. In just a moment, our keynote speech. Thanks very much for being back with us. Um, we're going to uh, have an opportunity now to speak uh, at distance this time with uh, uh, Marco Bar Bertaka, who is the CEO of Corn Foods uh, and who joins us now uh, remotely. 
Um, we're starting a little bit late and for which I apologize. I, I, I do hope he's able to join us uh, now. Um, for now, my screen doesn't tell me whether that's the case, but with any luck, we shall be able to hear from him shortly. Thank you very much for being with us uh, and we look here forward to hearing your thoughts. Excellent. I, I really hope uh, you can hear me. Unfortunately, as, uh, as you mentioned, I'm connected uh, uh, remotely. I am uh, not able to be in Paris, uh, very, very unfortunately. And uh, uh, my name is Marco, Marco Bertac. I am uh, working for Corn Foods. And uh, I have quite an ambitious objective for today, which is to share some energy with you all, wherever you are. And uh, I realize this is quite an ambition to do it via camera. And uh, uh, the energy I want to share with you is the type of energy that drives actions, not just ideas, that identifies solutions and not just reflects on existing problems. I think we have enough of those. And more than anything is the positive energy that builds on the power of partnership. Uh, now, imagine if by working together, we could create protein from waste. Now, I hope that by now I got your full attention. And, uh, well, I, if you want to hear a little bit more about the why, you would have to stay uh, for at least another 10 minutes with me. <laughs> it's so, very well sold. Uh, I think you have our absolute attention, and we're looking forward to hearing exactly <laughs> on that, what you <laughs> have to say. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, listen, the, the very essence of this conference, I think, of this session, is really to, uh, to try to gather momentum around collaborations. And I've been reflecting what, uh, what is the fundamental thing, what really brings us together. Uh, I believe that food brings culture together. It's, it's in fact the one thing that uh, we really, really share, all of us. Being able to make a dish and share with the people you love is one of the most universal concepts because it's at the root of the survival of the human species. But according to a recent United Nations report, achieving zero hunger by 2030 is now in doubt. We have to acknowledge that our global food system is broken. 690 million people were hungry in 2019, and that's an increase of 60 million just in the last five years. We've been going in the right direction for a while, but then we started to go backwards. And the pandemic has added another 130 million people into chronic hunger at the beginning of 2021. Now, it's not just about hunger, unfortunately. While 2 billion people are overweight or obese, 460 million are underweight. And unfortunately, 45 million of those are children under five years old. What is even more striking and upsetting, I would say, is that all of this happens while one third of all the food produced for human consumption is lost or wasted globally. This is 1.3 billion tons per year. Now, I'm not just quoting figures from available reports. I've, uh, I've lived and worked in the Philippines for a number of years, and I've seen with my own eyes how the need to feed yourself and your family drives people to search through waste for material they can reuse or resell, and even, in the case of wasted food, rework into a different type of food that can be, again, edible for humans. So it's a, it's a very, very real problem in, in a great number of areas around the world. And this is why we are really presented with the biggest opportunity of our times. No single company, government, or individual will be able to fix the food system by themselves. Mm. Only a global collective effort will. And that's what we are clearly talking about today. So what are we going to collaborate on? Uh, well, I want to focus your attention today on fermentation. Now, we're all spending an enormous amount of money and effort and resources in developing new food technologies. And that's absolutely fine. But today I want to focus on one of the first food technologies ever developed by humans and the immense magic impact of fermentation. Now, historians have traced back signs of the initial fermentation in food and beverage, dating back as, uh, as far as 7,000 7, BC. Now, yeast, for example, has been around for 80 million years, and the fermentation technique was initially used as a way to preserving food and drinks. 
the health benefit of fermented food has been acknowledged for centuries and uh, uh, really comes from the fact that uh, we have living uh, or microorganisms like microbes, yeast and fungi uh, in the food and they transform sugars and starches, enhancing the natural beneficial bacteria in food. So early humans began to embrace the partnership with microbes because of its benefit. Uh, just to give you an example that I'm, I'm, is, is very, very close to me, also at Quorn, we have an amazing partnership with a microbe. Uh, and I want to give you a little bit of history here because this is not, not very well known, but it all started from the vision of a man in 1888, the gentleman called Lord Rank. He was a British entrepreneur and industrialist he had businesses in food and many other areas. And back in the 1960s, uh, we were in the middle of the global population boom. That's actually, unfortunately, where I come from. And uh, there was a real concern that the world would actually run out of food. So with this knowledge, uh, in particular on fermentation coming from, uh, he had a, a bread making company, Lord Rank challenged the scientists to find a microbe that couldn't convert the plenty of starch that was around into the less available protein that we thought we would run out of. Now, it was just a theory, just an idea. Uh, but then after an extensive search, uh, his team found a microscopic member of the fungi family called Fusarium venenatum. Now, that was just the beginning, and uh, it took, I can tell you, many, many years of research and uh, uh, huge investments and, and belief to develop what is today microprotein, which is the super protein now at the heart of every corn product. Wow. Now, Lord Rank didn't do this on his own. He had the initial idea, but he needed a partner that would buy into this idea. And a partner that would also have the expertise and the ability to ferment at commercial scale. He knew about fermentation, but he didn't know how to make it at a big, big scale. Now, he found that partner in a company called ICI. Uh, it's a British, it was a British chemical company. They took a big uh, risk, a, a huge leap of faith, and they started to, to work with Lord Rank and his team. Now, if we fast forward 20 years later, the first corn product were launched in, the, in England in 1985. And since then, over 8 billion servings have been sold in 20 countries around the world, including last year when we helped KFC to launch their first vegan burger here in the UK. Now, corn is today the only global player capable to produce microprotein at huge scale, again proving that uh, even a man with a, such a vision could not do this alone, and he needed a number of key partners to realize his dreams. Now, personally, I wouldn't claim to know, uh, to be an expert in fermentation, but uh, I can assure you that before joining Quorn, I've done my own bit of, of due diligence. And this is why I can today comfortably call uh, Quorn's protein a, a super protein. Now, not just because it's high in fiber and protein, uh, it's low, so low in saturated fat, it doesn't contain any cholesterol, and not just because it has protein quality score that is higher than meat. I call it a super protein because it, it has scientifically proven nutritional properties, something that cannot be said of all other alternative proteins. Now, for more than two decades, Quorn uh, partnered with uh, leading UK universities. I can mention a few, Exeter, Imperial College, King's College in London, just to, just to name some of them, to really better understand how microprotein is able to perform and uh, to be able to provide the scientific evidence to support it. Now, I would love uh, to tell you much more about this, but uh, uh, there's a lot of independent scientific research. Those who are more curious about uh, uh, our microprotein, I will, I will uh, suggest to connect our chief scientific officer, Dr. Tim Finnegan, who leads our research program. So once again, for us, working with all these uh, institutions representing another example of how long-term partnership and collaboration uh, is, is really important for the uh, transforming big ideas into reality. Now, where is this all going now? How do I come back to our big ideas? 
So today, many other startup companies all over the world are adopting low rank discovery, and they started to grow propane from microbes. I just want to name a few, 3F Bio in the UK, Microena in Sweden, Prime Roots and Nature's Find in the US, and the Protein Brewery in the Netherlands, and many, many others. And in fact, investments in fermentation has really quadrupled in the last couple of years, to the point that uh, recently um, uh, some colleagues were challenging me and saying, look, Marco, you must be really unhappy with the, all these new kids on the block who, like us, are making protein from fungus. Now, I can assure you this couldn't be further for the truth. I really believe that there is an urgent need for mankind to adopt alternative protein sources on a huge scale. And as much as I would love it, corn alone cannot feed the world. It is going to take dozens, if not hundreds of companies like ours, to be able to make enough healthy protein to reduce our planet damaging reliance on animal protein. We will, of course, fight in the supermarket for shelf space, but away from there, there is a huge and important opportunity for new partnerships and collaboration to accelerate learning and collaboration. Now, this is why I'm here today. This is why I'm here asking all of you to join Quorn in our big sustainability idea. Again, creating protein from waste. Let me give you a bit of a background on this. According to the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, half of the world habitable land is currently used for agriculture. Half of the world habitable land used for agriculture. Now, scientists at King's College in London have estimated that every year, arable farming produces around 8 billion tons of carbohydrate waste. If we together could find a way to ferment that carbohydrate and make microprotein, we would be able to produce the same amount of protein that we would get from 5 billion cows. Wow. The numbers are mind-blowing. There's three times more cows than we have on the planet now. And even if you could just do a fraction of that, it would be a game-changer. A, a revolution. We could produce a super protein to feed the world, as well as reduce the carbon footprint created by food production. Wow. Now, what if we were able to create sugars from, for example, lignocellulose, containing arable waste instead of using glucose for, that is coming from wheat as our ingredient from fermentation? Again, using waste to be able to produce microprotein through fermentation. We could be able to use abundant sources, such as rice straw, for example, materials that today are simply either burned or plugged back into the ground. Now, I call, we have done some uh, uh, initial exploration of this idea, and some of you may be already be working on this or, or something similar, and that's absolutely fantastic. My message here is please get in touch. Let's work together. Let's do something about it. And if anyone, anyone would like to get involved in trying to make this idea a reality, please contact me directly. I would be delighted to talk. And the fact that I, I, I truly believe that the way we produce and source our food will dictate the future of our planet. And our food industry is currently working in the wrong, in the wrong trajectory. We urgently need we must find a way to keep global temperatures at a safe level while reducing the double burden of malnutrition that I discussed a bit earlier. And this simply cannot happen without a huge shift in cutting the carbon emission. And uh, this has to really happen across the whole supply chain. And we also need to increase the production of alternative proteins that produce a radically smaller environmental impact and footprint, like corn super protein, for example. Now, today I really feel that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's feeling like having this gigantic flywheel in front of me. And uh, the truth is that I know that corn by ourselves will not be able to spin it, will not be able to move it. It's just too big. The task is too heavy, even for us at corn with 25 years of experience. 
What I'm asking to you today is to give us a hand in moving together this enormous wheel of possibilities. As I'm sure, as it starts moving, more and more people and more and more companies will join us, and we will be able to create a real unstoppable movement. Now, at that point, we will be able to change the world. And looking back, I would say even Long Grunk would be proud. But it's looking forward, actually, that our children would really be proud of us. Thank you very much. Marco Vetaka, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it's been listening to you. First of all, on those extremely stark figures that I think it's important to hear repeated and stated so clearly, but also the sense of, of hope and possibility, uh, as you suggest, to deal at once with the twin challenges of climate change, but also the hunger that is such a blight on the world today. We're so grateful for your time and for your message of hope. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That brings us to the end of this uh, particular session uh, of uh, Change Now. Uh, we've uh, heard and spoken to a number of CEOs at the forefront uh, of this struggle to try and bring sustainability to the hearts of their businesses and, of course, how that can work within the wider struggle of humanity as it seeks for those sorts of solutions. We're very grateful for your attention. Thanks to all of those who took part and to all of you who followed today's discussion. Thank you so much.